Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Good Friday. So I have a little tradition, something that I like to do once a year that I'm hoping is going to lead us into a, a new apex of what this day is really all about. But to get there, we have to begin with the traditional way of seeing or understanding Good Friday, which is all about death. This is the day a particular man 2,000 years ago it endured one of the worst possible executions that you can imagine. And this is why the Roman Empire used crucifixion as their primary means of torturing and executing criminals because it was so horrible and it would be a deterrent. Nobody wants to be up on the cross. But as I said, today we're going to hopefully turn it around, but we have to begin somewhere. So I want to begin with this. I'm going to bring it out here so everybody in the computer can see it. If you were to look at the very, very, very center of that white cross, what you'll see are two splinters. Now, those are believed to be splinters from the actual cross of Jesus. How do we know this? We don't. It's certainly, this is a very, very old relic and it's been believed that for many hundreds of years. What we know from the story is that um, in the 300s, somewhere in the fourth century, Helena, who was the mother of Constantine, went to the Holy Land to try to identify the places in which many of the stories of the life of Jesus took place, his birth, and of course, his crucifixion and resurrection. And in the place where the, the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre stands, they found a they, they raised some kind of a temple and found buried underneath there three crosses. And they laid each of these crosses in the bed of a dying person. And the legend is, is that when the third cross was laid in the bed of this dying person, that person was healed. So this was then believed to be the cross of Jesus. This is what the tradition is. And they broke it up into three sections. One section went to the Pope in Rome. Another section went to the Eastern Church in Constantinople. And the third section was broken up into splinters and was made into relics like this one. However, they do say that if you were to take every splinter from every church and put them together, you'd have about 18 crosses. <laughs> so who knows? Who knows? But this is something that, that I was able to get from an art dealer quite some time ago. So I wanted to show that. This is kind of a show and tell day. Now for something, two things that are even more morbid. <laughs> so I'm going to leave this up here. So any of you want to come up and see it later, you can. This is an actual 2000 year old Roman spearhead. Okay. It would have been attached to the spear here. And this would have been the point. So we know from the story of the crucifixion of Jesus that this was something like it that pierced his side. And even more interesting is a 2,000-year-old Roman crucifixion nail. Oh. These were actually made for one purpose and one purpose only, for crucifixion. So once again, I'm going to leave these up here. So if any of you want to come and see them after the session, you can. So why am I showing these? Other than once a year to get out my, my little relics. It's once again to, to show the, the common traditional focus on what this day is all about, which is death. Now, I want you to see, if, even for a moment, you can appreciate what things were like 
when this happened 2,000 years ago. The first thing you have to remember is that at that time, there was a new Messiah coming around the corner almost every other month. This was a messianic era with the Roman Empire occupying the Holy Land. So it was expected at any moment. And so every few months, someone would rise up and they would, you know, either they would say or the crowds would say, this must be the Messiah. Now, of course, we know that um, the, the typical Jewish understanding of, of Messiah, especially at that time, was very different than the role that we would look at through Jesus. It was believed to be um, more of, of a great military leader that would that would rise up and help them to defeat the occupying force. And so this was the, the role that most of these messiahs would take. And the Romans had a, uh, a policy, which was as soon as someone was determined or said that they were the messiah, get them up on that cross. Oh, right. Did not take long. They were very quick about it and it happened a lot. And the interesting thing was that in every case, as soon as that person was crucified and killed, their movement ended. Even if it was a one with thousands and thousands of believers, and that did happen. There were some that were that are still in the in the history books. But as soon as they were killed, the, the people who followed them disbanded and, and it was over. And this is the primary difference between what happened to the followers of those people and the followers of Jesus. And this is when we begin to come into more of, of this elevated, enlightened understanding of what the crucifixion is and is not. That it was not the end, it was the beginning. It wasn't the beginning of what happened on Good Friday, it was the beginning of what happened three days later. Because the holy, perfect child of God cannot die, cannot be claimed by death. Now, we might be tempted, as it so often traditionally is, is that this is reserved only for a story 2,000 years ago that happened to a man whose name was Yeshua. But I think that we have all come to the point now where we have, we're no longer separating ourselves from that story and saying that is happening now, whether I want to acknowledge that or realize it myself, it is happening now to and through each one of us. So what I wanted to do today, as you know, many of us here are are students of A Course in Miracles, not everyone. So we don't lean too heavily into the course. It does influence everything I, I share because it is my own personal path. But we want to keep it as universal and ecumenical as possible. But today I want to read something directly from the course because I, I've never read or heard anything that was this um, perfect in describing what death is and what death isn't. And I think this is very appropriate for us on this particular day as we begin our own journey toward Easter or toward resurrection and to realize this is not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. It's happening right now. So the question in the, the Manual for Teachers is, what is death? So I'm just going to read some of this and make comments. Death is the central dream from which all illusions stem. The central dream. Is it not madness to think of life as being born, aging, losing vitality, and then dying in the end? We've asked this question before, but now we need to consider it more carefully. It is one, it is the one fixed, unchangeable belief of the world that all things in it are born but to die. We can see that, right? That's pretty clear. And we don't question that. 
But what this is saying and what we need to question and I either affirm or deny, because you can't do both, is, is this first sentence true or false? Death is the central dream from which all illusions stem. If we affirm that and say, okay, I'm going to lay aside every idea I have ever had about who I am. This is what we talked about yesterday. Who I am, what the world is for, what this body is. What is death? If I'm going to lay aside all of those ideas, I have to have a resolute acceptance of this. Because once again, you can't do both. You can't affirm and deny in the same moment. But see, this is the spinning action of the ego, which says, oh, yes, you can. You can deny that and you can affirm it. Just watch me. I'm just going to keep you spinning around in a circle so that you get so damn confused. You think you can do both. And that's what the, that's what the ego is, basically. The ego is the idea that I can both affirm and deny death at the same time. And what this is saying is that you can't. You have to either choose one or the other. Either death is not real or death will claim everything and there's nothing I can do about it. Let me read further. This is regarded as the way of nature, not to be raised to question, but to be accepted as the natural law of life. The cyclical, the changing, the unsure, the undependable and the unsteady, waxing and waning in a certain way on a certain path. All of this is taken as the will of God. And no one asks if a benign creator could will this. You know, how, how many of us were, were raised and maybe even still have some, some concept of hell? I don't know about you, but the way I was raised was I, I could be a very, very, very good boy. I, and I was, well, kind of. Um, I was very mischievous, but I was very pious. At the same time, I went to church sometimes every day. I'd pray my rosary three times a day, and then I would go off and do stupid shit that was bound to... I, maybe I did all of these other things just to make up for the stupid shit that I was doing. I don't know. But I was I was taught uh, that I could be that pious boy, do everything, be the nice Catholic that I was raised to be. And, and yet if I did one thing, masturbate. That was the thing they kept pushing. Don't do that because that's a mortal sin. And if you did all of these things but did that once, God was going to throw you into an eternal pit of fiery hell. <laughs> This was drilled into me. How many of you had any form of that drilled into you? I actually see Amrit in the back. She's the only one with her hand up. <laughs> so let me ask this question as it was asked here. No one asks if a benign creator could will such a thing. This, the idea that you could do something that would condemn you to an eternal pit of fiery hell. Come on. <laughs> there has to come a point in which we say, come on. This is ridiculous. And there also has to come a point where we say that to death itself. How often do we see movies or plays or hear stories where death is personified? The great, Ing I can't say, Ingmar Bergman film. Ingmar? Ingmar? Whatever. Where he plays chess with death. Mm, yeah. So this is the point that we are at now. We have to deny or affirm this. And a whole mind affirms only one thing, that the holy, perfect child of God cannot die. And you are the holy, perfect child of God. Like it or not. <laughs> you have no choice. Let me read a little bit more. In this perception of the universe as God created it, it'd be impossible to think of God as loving. That's true, right? God can't be loving if, if you do one thing and get, you get, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> or who has decreed that all things pass away, ending in dust and disappointment and despair can be but feared? 
you know, um, the, this whole idea of the fear of God is just a mistranslation, just as everything else is. The, the original um, way that it was written, it would be to be in awe of God, not the fear of God, but the awe of God. But isn't everything here a mistranslation, a misunderstanding? And, and what creates that misunderstanding? It's one word. It starts with a G. Guilt. That's right. That is the, the foundation of that central dream that this is talking about. I'm condemning myself. God is not condemning me. There is no God out there. This idea that there is a being, an entity, watching, waiting, writing things down. That's the other thing that I think we have to dissolve until we can come to the point of realizing that that which we call God is simply love itself. And love cannot condemn. Love does not condemn. Okay, I'm just going to skip over some of this. Death is the symbol of the fear of God. God's love is blotted out in this idea of death, which holds it from awareness like a shield held up to obscure the sun. The grimness of the symbol is enough to show that it cannot coexist with God. It holds an image of the Son of God in which he is laid to rest in devastation's arms. This is so beautiful. <laughs> this part, maybe not. Where worms wait to greet him. <laughs> and to last a little while by his destruction. Yet the worms as well are doomed to be destroyed, just as certainly. And so do all things live because of death. Devouring is nature's law. God is insane. And fear alone is real. You really do have to get to the point where you, you look at all of these crazy ideas that we've been given about God and say that God is insane. And there is no God like that except in my own mind. Therefore, Who's insane? Me. But I can come to sanity any moment that I can realize that the holy, perfect child of God is free and cannot die. I'm going to read one more line here. Then I'm going to ask Laurel if, if you would come up mm -hmm. and share whatever's in your heart. This is, it's amazing because the entire Course in Miracles uh, can come down to this. In fact, it says, teacher of God, your one assignment could be stated as thus, accept no compromise in which death plays a part. Accept no compromise in which death plays a part. Oh, that is a complete reversal, isn't it? That is a complete turnaround of this upside down universe mm -hmm. to come to whole mindedness, right thinking. So how do we do that? How, how do we take on our assignment as this is given to us, accepting no compromise in which death plays a part? I'm going to let Laurel ask the, answer that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always love when Laurel is here. And, and if we have time, let's see if we can get Calico in here as well. <laughs> Vicky couldn't be with us today. She is is on tutu duty. So I'm sure she would have a good answer to that too. But I'm but I love when Laurel shares. So come on up, Laurel. Thank you. <laughs> what a happy surprise. <laughs> we used to do this a lot. Okay, all right. Yep. Here you go, Laurel. Finish it up for <laughs> jumping. Oh, accept no compromise where death plays a part. Um, I was taking in that lesson. Thank you. And just right before James asked me to come up, I remember that um, if I seem to be 
a fleshy body in time and space, it seems that death is the ultimate. The Grim Reaper is going to get me. Death and taxes are real here. And, and that has a seriousness and we can live frivolously or blissfully and find the most, eke out the most happiness we can from a limited situation. And that's one idea, making the best of this because we're all going to die sooner or later. And I even heard someone quote recently, like, God giveth and God taketh away. And that's not true. God only gives. So what is it that will be taken away? It's our identity when we give it up. Not when we die, but when we give it up. And what better time than now? So if I haven't given up my identity as a human being, I'm dead already. That was the thought I had just before. Like if as I identify here, I'll be in fear. I'll I'll be afraid for your life or mine on in some form. I'll need to eat the right food, know the right people, keep myself safe. Will there be enough water 10 years from now? How will how will this work out for me today, the next 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. It's all an idea that I'm this identity. And that's that's death. That's self-crucifixion. So life, I love how James opened it up too. We have an opportunity to remember who we are now. And that is nothing to do with limitation. Death is an idea. We're plotting our way to an admission sooner or later that we're powerless. As a human being, we're powerless. As who we really are, the Holy Son of God himself, as the Course in Miracles says, an extension of the love of God. As I remember that, everything else fades away. So we can have one or the other. Thank you, James, for opening it. One or the other. And in this instant is my holy instant of release. This is the one I can choose and experience the life of reality. and there is no other real choice there is only that choice so it's like we're frozen in time until we choose real we're just we can say dreaming a dream and that's not spiritual bypassing as long as we recognize it's our dream not a co collective conscious dream but individually put your hand on your heart and say I am the one who is awakened now. I am the one who is awakened now. Did I leave room for Calico? Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. I love you. There's always room for Calico. <laughs> 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 Good morning, Calico. Good morning. Uh, this is great. Um, wow. There's so many different ways to take this. I think uh, the first thing I want to say, I am a Course in Miracles student. That's really all I am. I'm not a Christian. I'm not an atheist or an agnostic. I follow a Course in Miracles because it's not a religion. It's a mind training to love everything period, <laughs> no exceptions. And I mean, it can be applied with anyone from any religion, but it is not a religion. And I love Jesus just as a guy that went through this process. So he was able to be quote unquote crucified and he was forgiving himself for seeing himself as crucified. And, um, <clears throat> You know, I wish, I, I don't know, it's either the first five lessons or first 15 lessons. Everything I make up, I, I make everything up. And then I make it a belief. And then as someone with the biggest I know mind I know, <laughs> I try and convince everyone else that I know. 
And it's that's where I got into massive trouble because I made all these beliefs up <laughs> that are just concocted and um, they were doomed to crucify someone and resurrect someone else. So my whole life has been specting, it has been crucifying and then resurrecting. And it's usually crucifying you and resurrecting me by my I know mind, which you can see where there's an inherent complication in that. And with um, the cancer, it really altered everything because I really got, I need to really make some peace here. And one of the things that Jesus does say in A Course in Miracles, death is a non-event. Death is a non-event. And so it's kind of like, why am I making such a big deal out of it? But when I thought I was dying, it was a big deal. I was terrified. I was just absolutely terrified. But the reality was after I started taking all these beliefs that were cluttering my mind and unwound them one at a time. And this is where A Course in Miracles can seem difficult because you really have to get that you're either crucifying something or you're resurrecting something. There is no other. There is no other. So you have to really get honest with yourself that you're crucifying. And that's the painful part to admit that you have these thoughts in your mind where you just, you know, you think, God, I wish they'd just shut up. And there may be some of you having this right now with me, and that's fine. I'm fine with it. I don't hold, I don't hold any grievances. And it's kind of um, this process of taking every single belief that I knew to be true, dismantling it, and coming to the truth that they're just all lessons that I would learn. Everything is a lesson I would learn. Absolutely everything. You know, it's like those people that interpreted the crucifixion in a certain way as hard and horrible. You know, really, the way I look at it is Jesus was attempting <laughs> to gift us a very big lesson. And um, instead of joining in of Jesus's apparent suffering, I join in Jesus's beauty, love. And, and that's why this morning when I woke up, I was thinking, here we go. Okay, it's Good Friday. You know, this is where we crucify ultimately. And really getting that, um, I'm gonna make this decision today that I'm crucifying no one. And this morning I woke up and I had a little complaint in body, first thing. And I immediately went, nope, not true. Because A, I'm not a body. Course in Miracles is very clear about that. And B, if I'm focusing on something wrong in the body, that's insanity. You know, I'm, I'm, I just finished watching this great Netflix series, Three Body Problem. And it, it talks about this whole population that is using virtual reality glasses to wake up from the dream they know to be true. Isn't that great? I actually was working on this with someone not too long ago. And it really is, you put on the virtual reality glasses and it tells you where you're making your mistake in whatever it is that you're going through. And so I just love that we're, you know, we're now catching up to the fact that, oh, I need to counter the mind training that was given me from birth. And it's like, I am not a special little somebody that needs to be cherished and loved in this world because I'm already ultimately cherished and loved by the one that matters, God, because I'm created as God. And I took help, I have had a lot of, emails from Christians that found this, you, uh, you're you blaspheming, saying that you're the Christ. And it's like, well, it makes me happy. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry if that's a problem. But, you know, it's kind of like um, this is A Course in Miracles. And I just invite anybody that's, you know, whatever faith, I don't care what faith you are, take it on. You know, it's it's just mind training to see that I am love and truly the only way I can be truthful is by extending that I am this love, period. There is nothing to see as error or wrong. 
you know, and, and everything is in, there is no, there's not even innocence because there is nothing wrong, you know? So anything that we come up in mind, there's an, a contrary to that. And that's where the, the mind training comes in is just to see when I'm thinking, Ooh, that's not nice. <laughs> and it's kind of like, who says calico? I mean, well, I do. Well, who's I? Well, oh, it's ego. Because I don't even exist in God's realm. I'm just a loving thought in the mind of God. And that's where I need to get to in my mind is I'm a loving thought in the mind of God. And that's all that really matters. And that's the only place I need to extend from is, is that, that place. So, oh man, what a topic for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, all. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs> yeah. What a topic for five minutes, indeed. <laughs> or a half hour, or 35 minutes, or whatever it is. But now we get to go out and and and, and just let it let it move through us and make our final decision. Because once again, you can't do both. You can't deny and affirm. You know, I, I have to choose, am I going to choose life or am I going to choose that I'm a body that must die? No matter what it looks like is happening, because, you know, the body is going to do what the body is going to do. The body is going to, you know, whatever. But that has nothing to do with who I am, just as Laurel said. I'm not this identity. So we're going to close with just this. Just, this is the very final sentence or two of that section in the manual for teachers it says this what is the end of death nothing but this the realization that the child of god is guiltless now and forever nothing but this but do not let yourself forget that it is not less than this and to that we say, Amen, 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 I Junto. So even if you go off today and watch our, our uh, gardener get crucified, <laughs> he apparently has been doing this for a few years, so he's, he's good at it. But, you know, in fact, go out there and because the procession for the crucifixion goes right out here on Juarez. If you want, go out and, and look through what seems to be happening. Look through that story and just remember the holy, perfect child of God is free. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And because we won't be doing a service here, I mean, there will be a unity service here on Easter, but we won't have our morning service. Happy Resurrection Day as well. Amen. See you next week. Bye.